You're listening to The Voluntary Life, where you can hear ideas for finding freedom in an unfree world. Visit thevoluntarylife.com to connect with the show and hear all past episodes. Here's your host, Jake. Hi, it's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. This week's episode is about investing. I'm going to share with you some questions that I had from supporting listeners about the permanent portfolio. I've spoken a number of times on this podcast about the approach to investing that I follow, the strategy that I've adopted, which is called the permanent portfolio. This is not something that I invented. It's not my idea at all. It's just the best strategy that I found. I've looked at a lot of portfolio designs and investment strategies, and this is the one that makes most sense to me. Many of the listeners who support The Voluntary Life as patrons are also investors, private investors, and they have various different approaches. And one of the topics that comes up quite a lot on the Q&A live streams that I do is questions about the permanent portfolio, comparisons of the permanent portfolio strategy to other strategies, and discussions about the potential benefits or limitations of the permanent portfolio as a strategy. So in this episode, I'm going to share with you two questions from patrons from two different bonus episodes of The Voluntary Life. Before we get to the episode, though, I do want to say a big thank you to my new patron on Patreon, Jean. This podcast is being brought to you because of the support of people like Jean. You're about to get a taste of the kind of thing that you can hear on bonus episodes, but there are many other ones that you can get by becoming a supporting listener of The Voluntary Life. There are currently 74 bonus episodes, and I'm adding more all the time, and many other rewards, including my productivity templates. So if you enjoy the show, and especially if you've been listening for a while, I would really appreciate your support by becoming a patron on Patreon or alternatively by supporting me with cryptocurrency on Bitbacker. If you would like to find out more, you can click on the link that I will put in the show notes, and you can also find out more information on my website, thevoluntarylife.com. Just a quick note about the conversations that you're about to hear. The sound quality is not as good as you would normally hear on a Voluntary Life episode. I'm sorry about that. There were some technical problems on one of the two conversations that you're about to hear, but I think the topics are still very interesting, so I want to share them with you anyway, and it's perfectly possible to hear and understand everything. It's just not the same level of audio quality that you normally hear on my show. Also, in the first conversation that you're about to hear, the listener who is asking me questions was typing them into the chat window rather than using a microphone. So you will hear me read out his question to start with, and then you'll hear my responses. So without further delay, here are two discussions about the permanent portfolio. Which asset class is property closest to in the permanent portfolio? I'm guessing gold. If it is, what are the differences and similarities? Right. Very good question. So... The concept of the permanent portfolio, as I've talked about before, was by Harry Brown, was the idea was to find assets that would predictably do well in different economic conditions. And he made the argument that real estate doesn't predictably do well in specific economic conditions in the way that these other asset classes do. So... He said that when you look at something like, let's say, let's take, for example, gold. Gold is used as a monetary metal and it's also used for jewelry and so forth. And the the whole concept behind holding gold in the permanent portfolio was in periods of very high inflation, then gold would perform extremely well because that has been the way that the markets have tended to, to work predictably in other when in, when you take similar economic conditions and underlying that there's a very good reason why gold would perform well when fiat currency is uh is being inflated now you could say as you've said in your comment that real estate or property are probably closest to gold in the permanent portfolio and i think harry brown would say that too because it tends to be something that works well um, if you're in a, it's a real asset. So if you're in a period of very high inflation and if uh, the money supply is being increased very rapidly, real estate won't be increased. The supply of real estate will not be increased rapidly. And so as a real asset, it should hold value. But he would make the argument that the real estate market is also subject to other constraints and other um, influences. And therefore, it's not necessarily going to be 
as it's not necessarily going to be to, so an asset that works in specific circumstances in the way that you want uh, in the permanent portfolio. So the idea of the permanent portfolio was you want to be holding assets that no matter what happens, you're going to be fine because you know that one asset is going to be doing well and doing really overperforming compared to all the others. And the issue with real estate is that it's not really seen, it doesn't really work as an inflation hedge quite in the same way as gold does. There are lots of reasons for that, not least of which real estate is very sticky, has high transaction costs. So, for example, you can't just sell a fraction of your house easily. There are ways to do that, but it's not that easy. And you can't sell your house with in, in any kind of short, uh, rapid response investor time frame. You, it takes months. Um, even under the best of, of circumstances. Now, of course, there are real estate investment trusts, so you can use that. You can turn real estate into a, a much more liquid asset by investing in a real estate investment trust and that kind of thing. But the argument would be that it's not quite the same as holding something uh, like a commodity like gold. So, in answer to your question, yes, you're right. It probably would be gold would be the closest proxy in the permanent portfolio. But um, Harry Brown does talk about it in his discussion of why he chose these particular asset classes. And I've mentioned some of them there. So I hope that makes sense. But that's a, uh, a brief summary. Is there anything, you, if your mic's not working, is there anything you wanted to um, further ask about that? Or, or you can type into the chat if your mic's not working. I hold some real estate but want to diversify. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the tricky thing about real estate is that it's not liquid. <laughs> Uh, it's so it it does make it um it does make it difficult. So I was you say I hold some real estate but want to diversify. So wondering how that would work with the permanent portfolio. Okay, that's a great question and I can answer that too. So the way that that would work with the permanent portfolio, I would suggest is that it would work like this: you would have your permanent portfolio, and you would have what Harry Brown called a variable portfolio, which is anything else that you want to invest in too. Now, some people choose to have a permanent portfolio, which is 90% of their assets and a variable portfolio, which is 10 or 95% and five. But there's no reason why you can't decide to have a permanent portfolio that starts off as being a very small proportion of your assets. And you could have the vast proportion in your variable portfolio. And you can just decide over time to slowly build up a permanent portfolio if you want to diversify. And if you're not able to, because real estate isn't liquid, if you're not able to, to do that you know, in a, a, in a very quick way, you could just build it up slowly. But that's the way it would work, is you would have your variable portfolio, which would be property, and then you have a permanent portfolio, which would be the classic four assets if you wanted to go down the permanent portfolio route and then you'd have to decide for yourself what your rules were about how much you wanted to invest in the permanent portfolio and how you wanted to add to it and the only real thing that um harry brown suggested about that was don't use your permanent portfolio to fund your speculations if you your whole idea of the permanent portfolio would be that you that's where you're storing if you like your long-term uh security uh, and so if you invest in, let's say you, you decide in your variable portfolio to take a punt on some cryptocurrency and then it falls through the floor, what you wouldn't do is then say, oh, dear, well, let me take a bunch out of my permanent portfolio and try another cryptocurrency. You'd have, you have to basically decide how much you're going to risk in a, in a variable portfolio. Uh, and I put risk in quote marks because this is the way Harry Brown would think about the relationship between a permanent and a variable. And then the idea would be don't, don't keep taking money out to fund the variable from the permanent because the permanent is supposed to be permanent. That's supposed to be something for the, for the long term. So that's really the only kind of guidance that he would give on that but if you chose to start a permanent portfolio you can always start holding the vast majority in your variable portfolio and then just decide over time to build up a permanent one if that's the way you, that you would uh, want to do it and the way that that would work is that those four asset classes in the permanent portfolio wouldn't really be related to your property they would be separate you'd treat them uh, as look at them as percentages against each other and then your variable portfolio would contain your property, and that would be like a separate thing. I commented this on your Facebook group. And I was asking about um, regards to the permanent portfolio, the stocks portion. 
Yeah. It seems like folks who are, let's say, based in the U.S. tend to put their stocks allocation into U.S. stock indexes. Sounds like, in your case, since you're U.K.-based, you put your stock allocation into a U.K. Uh, uh, stock market in some kind. I mean, why? And so I understand. I, I think my question was, you know, why wouldn't you look for an index that tracks the global stock markets? Wouldn't that be a better hedge? And frankly, I would imagine that the U.S. and the U.K., if you just look at the kind of world averages, are probably at, at the lower end of the scale, at least in recent years, since there are many countries, you know, that are developing that are growing at faster rates. Um, and, I, and I understand the argument that, hey, you know, if, you, if you're invested in the U.S. or U.K. stock markets, a lot of those companies are doing business internationally anyway. So you are, in a sense, invested internationally. But I'm not sure that necessarily is an argument not to look for an index product that invests globally as, as kind of its core uh, tenant, which I know I think Vanguard has a couple and Fidelity has some. You know, where it's actually called like something like the Fidelity International Stock Market Index or something like that. Right. I think that is a great question. And I'm one that I've thought about a lot um, myself. I might have even, I can't remember if I've talked about this on any previous episodes, but I'll give you a quick summary of my thinking on it here. Why not have an international version of the permanent portfolio? Or if not that, then why not just have an international portfolio? I think there's, a, there's a, a few reasons why the permanent portfolio is set up in that way. I think when Harry Brown designed the permanent portfolio, he sort of more or less thought that the U.S. economy was so dominant that if you were in dollars, then you were. It was as you mentioned, you, it's pretty international anyway, and it has such a big effect on the global economy that I think he just figured that was international enough. But also, I have a feeling he was just dealing for dealing with an American audience, so he just designed it for Americans. The reason that I have a UK permanent portfolio is because I think it, it makes a lot of sense when you're investing your money in a permanent portfolio to use the economy that you're making the money in and that you're likely to spend the money in. Because ultimately, I mean, I was earning pounds when I was putting money into my permanent portfolio. And now I'm still, um, we're spending still a lot of time in the UK. So I'm spending here as well. And it's this currency that I'm using and this economy. Now, obviously, since then, I also, had, uh, we've started to do a much more international lifestyle. And although this year, we're kind of reassessing how much time we are going to spend traveling now that we have a daughter, I, did, I had thought a lot about, well, should I switch this permanent UK based permanent portfolio to an international version and have, as you say, like a global index of stocks and a global index of bonds. The reason that I never did that is because one of the key benefits of the permanent portfolio is volatility harvesting. And what you're doing there is you're, you're basically using the fact that the four different parts of the portfolio are tended to perform well in different circumstances to your own benefit. So, for example, if the UK economy has a lot of growth, then the stocks should do well and the bonds should do well. And that part of the portfolio will carry you even if it's a time when there's relatively low inflation and gold is not doing particularly well and, and cash is not doing particularly well. But in other circumstances, if something changes in the UK economy, like let's say there's a tight money recession in the UK economy, then you have the, the cash in your portfolio is what's going to carry you through that part because that is the bit that's going to particularly work well against the other parts of the portfolio that don't work well. So cash will suddenly have very high interest rates and your stocks will fall in value. And for example, if there's a lot of inflation in the UK, then the gold portion is, is what's going to carry you. So basically, that, that's a long rambling way of saying simply this. When you have a permanent portfolio, it works well if the four different asset classes all work differently against each other and that is what happens if they're all based in the same currency. But if you have a kind of global index, then it's going to be a lot. There's going to be a, it's, it's going to be probably even less volatile overall because it will be averaging over lots of different economies. But you won't get the same volatility harvesting that you do with the permanent portfolio. A lot of the gain in the permanent portfolio is capital gain. 
um, especially in these times of low interest rates. So given my strategy with the permanent portfolio, I think what makes most sense is to have it in one currency so you can benefit from that volatility harvesting. And my thoughts about moving to a different currency was just really, well, I don't know how long we're going to spend in any other particular place. So I could move it to dollars, but we're not really necessarily going to be in the US that much. So it doesn't make sense to switch from the UK permanent portfolio to a different one unless we, let's say we we really did settle in the EU. Then I would probably switch my permanent portfolio to an EU permanent portfolio because that would be where I would be spending the money. But in, until we do that, it's for the volatility harvesting um, aspect of it. And I don't know how to set up an international permanent type portfolio that would still have that volatility harvesting component. Yeah, that makes sense. And I guess uh, I was thinking very specifically about the stocks portion, but what you say, I guess, sort of makes sense. I, I guess in my thinking about it, uh, while I could see an argument for maybe uh, uh, choosing an ind- a global index versus a, a national index, at the same time, I think to your point, it's a little bit unpredictable how if you're otherwise in your other com- your component areas like your bonds and your your cash, in a, you know you have to be national in those <laughs> in those arenas. I mean, I don't really see a way around that uh, unless you. I don't know. I guess you could, in theory, try and spread your cash out over a number of different currencies, but then it starts to get away from the core principle of sort of being simple and easy to track and all this kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. But un- unless. So if you're if you're already invested in a national way in your cash and in your and in your bonds, it's a little bit hard to predict how the global stock market index would perform relative to that. So I could see that as being an argument for um, sticking with, like you say, uh, all all one country and in those three components of your permanent portfolio. I guess I could also see that some folks, if you're, let's say, you were from. Um, I don't know, Zimbabwe, right? <laughs> you might still choose maybe maybe a little bit of a different allocation than just wherever you're you're uh laying your roots or wherever you're you're based. Well, two things on that. So firstly, I think that these international stock index funds, they generally appeal to people who have almost all of their investments in the stock market and they think, well, what happens? Let's say that it's an American what who's got they're invested really heavily in stocks. And they think, well, what happens if the US economy tanks? Wouldn't it be nice to be diversified and have some Asian stocks that maybe would be doing different, you know, would be actually performing uh, differently to the US market? So they're trying to diversify and hedge and protect themselves against stocks declining in the US. The permanent portfolio strategy is to say, well, if stocks are declining, then what else is going on? And so, for example, if it's a tight money recession, then cash is going to be valuable. If it's a a very inflationary stagflation type recession, then it's going to be gold and so forth. So I think it's a way of achieving diversification. And the way I've chosen to or people who follow the permanent portfolio choose to diversify is rather than by taking the stocks part and getting stocks from another country, you have different asset classes. Because a lot of people don't even invest in multiple asset classes. They they are all in, in stocks or maybe just some bonds. So that's the first thing I wanted to say. But the second thing is, you mentioned a very interesting example is, okay, well, what about if you're in Zimbabwe? Well, think of it this way. If you were in Zimbabwe and you held a permanent portfolio, then your gold relative to to Zimbabwe would, would go through the roof, right? So gold gives you that interna- an international element and gold protects you against some crazy thing happening in your own country. In fact, yeah, Jonas has just mentioned that. I thought the gold price was uh, determined globally. So that's right. That's why gold is effectively your your kind of link to a value that's independent of the currency that the rest of your permanent portfolio is in. So for example, if you were in Argentina or Venezuela or Zimbabwe or any of these other countries that hyperinflated If you were following the permanent portfolio, a quarter of your assets would be held outside the country in gold. And consequently, once 
you know that hyperinflation comes to an end that gold that gold is going to be worth millions in your home currency if you if you like um now obviously those millions are all, all totally uh, inflated millions but the point is the point being it's going to save you from collapse because at least that proportion of your portfolio is going to perform incredibly well re- relative to the rest of your home economy yeah no that, that makes a lot of sense thank you uh, i was wondering since i'm coming from a tiny country like denmark it kind of sounds counterintuitive to base the portfolio just in denmark because it's such a small economy you mentioned the EU based or something like that, Euro based. Is, is that would that be an alternative? Yeah, I mean, it really is. This dependent- is a spoiler. I've never invested in anything. I'm total novice, just so you <laughs> know what level I'm at. Yeah. So the the idea it would be that it, even though Denmark obviously has its own economy, the thing is because of the euro, all of the other the Danish economy is massively affected by the fact that it's in a currency union with the rest of the EU, and consequently. Denmark is massively affected by what happens to the euro. Oh, hang on. You have your own currency. You're not in the euro. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, we, we do. But it's, it's very closely tied to the, the, the exchange rate between the Danish kroner and the euro is almost fixed. Oh, that's interesting. I, I, I didn't know that. I, I didn't know that at all. Because I don't know about this, I would have to look into it. If it's the case that you have the Danish kroner, but it's essentially fixed to the euro, then I would say then you're still basically within the euro, uh, then you're still fixed to the euro. But if actually it's not, then yeah, even though it's a small currency, if you were going to do a permanent portfolio, you'd probably do it in Denmark. Uh, that would probably be the way that the classic permanent portfolio would be set up. Now, whether that's a good idea or not, because of the Danish economy being smaller, I don't know, because I just don't know enough about Denmark. It depends on what they've done with linking um, the Danish currency to the... If, if it's more or less basically li- um, fixed, then it probably does mean that it would be you'd be looking at the Eurozone. But otherwise, yeah, you probably would do, if you were going to do a permanent portfolio, do it in your own country. Now, I've never thought about doing it in a very small economy. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Thanks, yeah. <clears throat> no, thanks for your feedback. Um, yeah, we have a habit. My, my wife is Dutch, and we have a habit of moving from country to country from time to time within Europe. So perhaps we go for the EU-based... Yes, I should imagine that given how closely everything else in the Danish economy is going to be affected by Europe, that it probably would make a lot of sense. I mean, for example, if if the exchange rate changes, so if the interest rate changes in euro, what's going to happen to the Danish currency? Is, that, is the interest rate going to change there? My guess is if it's really strongly linked, then it would do. Um, but that would definitely be something to to look into. You know, the other thing that you could do, actually, Jonas, if you specifically are interested in the, in the permanent portfolio, then you could ask this question on the permanent portfolio discussion board. I don't have it in front of me now, but I can do out a link. But there is a discussion board of people who follow this investment strategy, and they're from all over the world. So you could basically say, look, I'm in Denmark. It's a small country, but what do you guys think? Do you think that means go for a euro one, or does anybody else have any experience with this? What are your thoughts? And you might get some interesting feedback. Thank you for listening to The Voluntary Life. If you like this podcast, please show your support by becoming a patron of The Voluntary Life on Patreon. Your support will help to grow and improve the show, and you'll get access to a treasure trove of rewards, including bonus episodes. Visit thevoluntarylife.com to learn more.